Well, well, welcome everyone. My name is Bill Sellers. I'm the president of National History Academy and we're thrilled to have you here today for the uh, next edition of our series on Little Rock Central High School and the story of the, the Little Rock Nine. Uh, we're, uh, we're honored to have Ranger Brian Schweiger with us today. And uh, the story of Little Rock and Central High School has been a part of, of National History Academy from the be beginning. We started uh, as a residential program in 2018, bringing in uh, very bright, uh, diverse students from all around the country to, um, to the area just outside of Washington, D.C. And uh, in both of our residential summers in 2018 and 2019, we had Ernest Green, one of the Little Rock Nine, speak with our students and talk about his experience in Little Rock. Last summer with, uh, with going virtual, uh, we were able to go to Central Rock High School and to, to get a tour of the, of the facility there. As we were studying uh, uh, cases designed by the Case Method Institute that was developed by um, Harvard Business School Professor David Moss, uh, having a wonderful array of speakers. And, uh, and this summer we've got uh, even more programs available for high school students. So uh, we hope that you'll take advantage of that. Uh, to introduce our speaker today, we have Brent Glass, who um, helped us start the program back in 2017 and 2018. Uh, he's the Executive Director Emeritus of the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. He has a long career in public history in the country. Uh, uh, has written a, you know, uh, I've got his book on my bookcase behind me right now, which I could pull out, but um, uh, you know, Brent's been a great friend of National History Academy and, uh, and a true leader uh, in our country and, and how we tell the story of American democracy. So I will turn it over to you, Brent. Thank you, Bill, and welcome everyone to today's program. Um, one of the key ideas behind the National History Academy is to focus on the power of place. And um, I, as Bill said, I wrote a book a few years ago called 50 Great American Places which uh, emphasize the importance of, of historic preservation, as well as uh, just general history education focused on uh, important historic sites in our country. And one of the sites that I wrote about and visited uh, was Little, in Little Rock Central High School. And it's a powerful experience and the National Park Service does an outstanding uh, job in interpreting this significant event uh, in American history and placing it in context. So I'm delighted that we're able to offer a virtual field trip uh, to the site today. And uh, Park Ranger Brian Schwiger is going to uh, lead us on this tour of uh, Central High, High School National Historic Site. Brian? Thank you, Brent. And we would have loved to have come to you, to, to all of you from Central High School itself, but the weather here in Arkansas is not cooperating. So we've got clear skies behind me now and I'm going to share my screen and we're going to talk about this story over the next little while and then we'll have time at the end for questions so get this up and running so behind me is Central High School built in 1926, 27, opened in 1927 as the largest high school in America. Uh, and at the time, the most expensive school that had been built in this country. Uh, the footprint of the school is massive. It would remind you of, of a big box store. Uh, you can see there the front landing has four statues above the main entrance and six doors that lead into this beautifully built Gothic school. Central High School was built at a time in this country when the Supreme Court, as just two generations before, had ruled in a case called Plessy v. Ferguson that separate but equal was allowable uh, with public accommodations. And this extended to public schools like Central High School. Not very far from where we stand today, the separate facility for African American students was built. Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School. Uh, you can tell just by this image taken from across the street at Dunbar. Uh, it, is, it is not equal. It is definitely separate. It is not at all comparable to Central High School. It was built at a fraction of the amount of money spent at Central High School, $1.5 million to build Dunbar, $400,000. It's roughly one third the size of Central High School. Separate but equal was a phrase 
um, where everything was separate and nothing was equal. And Dunbar and Central High School uh, could not epitomize this uh, in terms of their size. However, Dunbar was an amazingly run facility for African-American students. <laughs> Even at the disadvantage that not only did it serve high school students when it opened, it also served some junior high school students and some junior college students. So where Central High School had room to accommodate roughly 3,000 students in a massive facility, Dunbar proportionally would have, would have had more students in a much smaller facility across multiple disciplines with less of everything, less equipment, less books, uh, teachers being paid less, but Dunbar had extremely talented, gifted, educated teachers. Uh, more PhDs, more higher advanced degrees at Dunbar than at Central. Uh, Dunbar <laughs> thrived despite that inherent disadvantage it was placed in by Plessy B. Ferguson. Uh, May 17, 1954, Brown v. Board, this is an image on the steps of the Supreme Court was meant to completely overturn Plessy, right? Separate but equal, uh, no more separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Now comes the task to remediate this. You can see on the folded newspaper there the word segregation. Now comes the process of desegregation uh, to start uh, in earnest. There is another Supreme Court case in May, sorry, in, in 1950. 55, it's Brown 2, and the phrase that comes out of that, with all deliberate speed, it's meant to, to spur on and to encourage this compliance, but the issue then becomes many places, especially in the South, begin to move at a slower pace uh, and delay integration, claiming that that is what deliberate speed means, that they need time to really figure out a system to do this right. One year after Brown, before Little Rock integrates in 1957, there is an event that, that changes the calculus of everything. In, in Money, Mississippi, not three hours from Little Rock, uh, the murder of Emmett Till takes place. Uh, and the murder itself is horrific, but uh, the, the following case that's held in Sumner, Mississippi, of the two defendants who will later admit in an interview to Lit Magazine uh, of what they've done, uh, is a reminder of the changing times, especially in the South, and this idea of massive resistance to equal opportunity or to just opportunity uh, for African Americans. Let's enter this character here. His name is Orville Eugene Faubus. He actually takes office in 1955. When he is asked about the Brown decision, he makes quotes like, if I were a Supreme Court justice, I would have supported it. He is a Democrat. Most of the South is democratic and in stark opposition to integration. Famously, there's a document uh, from 1956 called the Southern Manifesto, drafted by Strom Thurmond uh, of South Carolina. The entirety of the South, congressional delegations, so the House of Representatives and Senates for the Confederate South, to a man, everyone signs it. And it is a pledge to essentially not honor the Brown. So Governor Faubus has made these comments that lead you to believe maybe he might be an outlier, that he might not stand in the way of the Brown decision taking place. The head of the Little Rock School Board uh, is a man named Virgil Blossom. Virgil Blossom is charged with putting the Brown decision into practice in, in Arkansas, uh, in Little Rock. And he talks about starting at first at the elementary school levels and working over seven to 10 years or roughly by 1963, to be in full compliance in Little Rock, K through 12. When studies are done and uh, some public hearings are held, he reverses course and decides that we will in fact start desegregation at the high school level in the city of Little Rock. We will start in 1957 because that will allow a couple things to happen. That will allow for the construction of a new high school, Horace Mann, that will replace Dunbar, a high school solely for African-American students to open uh, by 1955. By 1957, there will be an additional high school in Little Rock, Hall High School, which will allow a couple things to happen. It will allow students who attend Central, white students who 
choose not to attend an integrated school to essentially transfer to Hall. Uh, and it will also allow, again, this idea of massive resistance, right? If we can delay long enough, maybe the courts will step in uh, and either provide an injunction or some sort of relief to adhering to the law. So Central has chosen to start this in 1957. We said earlier, massive facility could hold 3,000 people. Central High School in 1957 is only going to accommodate a little over 2,000 students. And now the decision comes on what students will be transferred from Horace Mann or from Dunbar from ninth grade to 10th grade to come and desegregate this facility. Uh, right outside our doors is a street now named for this, this lady here, Daisy Gadsden Bates. Daisy Bates at this time is the president of the Arkansas State Conferences of the NAACP. Daisy Bates, you can see there on the, the sandwich board she's wearing, is one of the grassroots civil rights advocates here in the state of Arkansas, and, and very significant because Daisy, in addition to being a newspaper publisher, the Arkansas State Press with her husband, uh, is very active in this process of making sure integration happens. The previous two gentlemen you saw, Governor Faubus and Rogo Blossom, they know who Daisy Bates is. Daisy Bates really, in some ways, is, is one of one because here is a woman leading this charge toward integration uh, in an, a young civil rights movement primarily dominated by men. Daisy Bates then will help, she will assist with these students who will apply to transfer to have the opportunity to come to Central High School. Uh, Daisy's home is not far from here. This is the front of her house on West 28th Street. Daisy, as can be expected, faces, uh, faces that massive resistance herself. Uh, multiple occasions, either a cross is burned on her yard or um, a brick thrown through her window with a note attached to it uh, that says, stone this time, uh, dynamite next. Uh, Daisy is Daisy does not back down from this opportunity, uh, but but meets it head on. To Daisy's right there is her husband uh, Elsie Bates. Before we actually get to the story of Little Rock and kind of focus on this for a minute, let's talk about how we get to what we now know as the Little Rock Nine. We said Central High School could have accommodated, uh, you know, somewhere in the ballpark. 3,000 students. Today it's about a 2,500 or so facility uh, students. But Virgil Blossom, watch carefully or listen carefully how he does this. He says that of the 516 African American students who were of high school age who live in what he calls Central High School's attendance zone, that there will only be roughly, he says, about 200 who qualify to transfer. He notifies the principals at Dunbar, who will teach ninth grade students, and the principals at Horace Mann, who teach 11th and 12th grade, so sorry, 10th and 11th grade students. He lets them know that students there must register. They must apply to transfer. And so this way, there will be a, a way for him to keep those numbers in check. I'm sure he must have been delighted when not 200 students attempt to apply, but only 80 students. These students know, right, when you attempt to change something, that massive resistance we talked about can often find its way uh, into the local community. And there is this tangible fear since the murder of Emmett Till um, of retaliation for an attempt to change. But one of the future Little Rock Nine students, a uh, woman, uh, a young lady named Minnie Jean, Penny Jean talks about three things when she hears about Emmett Till's murder. She says, at first, I was dismayed and I was distraught. But soon that moved to me from anger into action. And I wanted, she says, I didn't want my hands to be clenched onto the other side of the fence watching this change happen. So 80 students sign up and say, I want to do this. They are essentially screened by the schools that they will leave, Dun Dunbar and Horace Mann. And 38 students are deemed to be uh, suitable choices, right? A, a Jackie Robinson candidate, uh, as they were called. 38 students sit down with Virgil Blossom. Virgil Blossom 
makes every attempt to discourage and reminds them of the limitations that they will face. Not only will you not be able to do any extracurriculars, uh, be in a club, athletics, plays, band, cheerleader, et cetera, but you won't get to attend any of those functions, right? So no senior prom, no junior prom, no homecomings. Uh, after he's done with his own pitch, we're down from 38 to 17. 17 students right before uh, the beginning of school will, will quickly be whittled down to 10. You see this crowd here that's formed in front of Central High School, and you'll notice a couple things. You'll see some people facing the camera, some people not facing the camera. Uh, uh, quite a collection of people. You can see in the distance there, the military. On the, uh, the school steps and on the sidewalk in front of Central High School, the governor decides to throw a wrench into these plans for integration. He goes on television here in, in Arkansas the night before school is going to start. It, it's actually Labor Day evening. He speaks to the state. First day of school will be September 3rd. And he talks about a couple of things. He talks about these, he calls them caravans of violence that are on their way to Arkansas, on their way to Little Rock uh, to risk this integration. He talks about having evidence from the Little Rock Police Department of all the weapons, right? Knives, guns, etc., being just bought in droves and cleared off of shelves in this attempt to stop integration. So he says, I'm going to bring out the Arkansas National Guard to protect the citizens and property of this community. On that Tuesday morning, September 3rd, there's about 275-ish Arkansas National Guard all around this campus. On the first day of school, there is no attempt to integrate. Daisy Bates asks all those students, not the Leroy Nine, there's actually 10 students. She asks them all to stay home as a couple things happen. Let's make sure we have everything in place. We might only get one chance to do this. Let's make sure that the federal court downtown is not going to intercede and give an injunction where this has to be made. So Daisy is completely ready to go. Daisy Bates has no idea that the night before when the governor gets off of television um, with this plea for protection, that he contacts the head of the National Guard in Arkansas and says, essentially, your orders are to keep those students out of the school. On the first evening on September 3rd, after 2,000 plus white students have attended a non-eventful day of school, inside Central High School. Daisy Bates is given word from Virgil Blossom via Ronald Davies, the federal judge here in Little Rock, that we're ready to integrate. So Daisy makes plans and starts calling these students to let them know that we're going to meet right outside these doors where I'm sitting uh, at 13th and Park Street, where there's a bus stop where they can all easily either ride over, be dropped off. Daisy asks the students not to come with parents for fear of violence maybe. But she says, I'm gonna have a group of ministers uh, of, of several races and several denominations here ready to assist with this. Daisy makes nine phone calls. The problem is there's not nine students. One of those nine students, one of the eventual nine students is without a phone in her home. Her name's Elizabeth Eckford. Um, Elizabeth's day starts Early on September 4th, she gets up, she eats breakfast, she puts on a dress that she and her sister Anna had spent weeks hand sewing for this moment. And so Liz has no idea when she gets off the bus a little bit before 8 o'clock that she's early and that she's ahead of her peers who will come uh, moments later. Uh, and so Elizabeth walks to the corner of what is now called Daisy Bates and Park Street, and crosses the street. In this photo, you see Elizabeth, white dress, sunglasses with the gingham check on the bottom. To her right are members of the Arkansas National Guard, and to their right are Little Rock Central High School students. Notice there's no impediment to their uh, walking on campus, but Elizabeth, in talking to this soldier, he seems to be directing her uh, down the street. You see Elizabeth's hand almost kind of firming. I'm not allowed to come in here. Soldier tells her, not allowed to let you in here. You need to proceed down the street. She's met 1M. She's met the military. 
now she's going to meet the other two. If you look in this photograph, which is about halfway down the block, you see Central High School there in the background. In the foreground, you see the gentleman there in the bow tie with uh, the, the notebook in hand. He's one of the media. That's the other end. And behind Elizabeth is the third end. That's the mob. You can see a lot of things in this picture. You see the complete um, apathy of the Arkansas National Guard, right? No attempt to protect. You see students there behind the line of soldiers, smiles, laughter. You see the anger in the faces of children, teenagers, uh, mothers, fathers there right behind Elizabeth. Benjamin Fine is the gentleman there at, uh, at the far right of the photograph in the bow tie. He's an education reporter for the New York Times here, sent to cover this story. He's going to factor in here in just a little bit. But right behind Elizabeth, this is a different angle. This is a photograph uh, famously from a guy named Will Cowles. You see the face of a, another 15-year-old student named Hazel. Hazel is yelling at Elizabeth when the photo is captured. She's yelling, go back to Africa. So Hazel's right and turning backward to look at her father. It's a girl named Sammy Dean Parker. Sammy will eventually be expelled from Central High School, but allowed to return. She is uh, an agitator, uh, to say the least. Uh, this photograph, as it makes its way across the world, really, it, it puts a, a human face to what massive resistance looks like. And it, and it puts a human face to what these 10 students are going to face on this Wednesday morning. Elizabeth, after being turned away once at the corner and again by soldiers, pretty quickly figures out I'm not going to be allowed to, to make it inside Central High School. And now she is seeking refuge at the end of the street where there is a, another bus stop. You see here Elizabeth sitting just completely alone. If you, if you can see on her face this dejection, Central High School in the background, angry agitators. In the background, there's Benjamin Fine once again. Benjamin Fine, at home during this, uh, has a daughter who's also 15. And I often wonder if he doesn't see this, not through the objective eyes of a reporter, but through the subjective eyes of a father. He will sit down with Elizabeth, and he notices her tears. He wipes her face. He touches her face and says, and exhorts her to don't let him see you cry. Uh, the crowd is lathered into an, an even more intense fury by seeing a white man touch her face. Uh, the governor will, will ask for this man's name. And when he goes on to give press conferences, uh, condemns this man as a communist, right? The old insult uh, you can put to somebody's character 64 years ago. Elizabeth will sit on that bench for 35 minutes. A woman named Grace Lord, you see here, to Elizabeth's right in the, the striped dress will come and essentially uh, stand up for Elizabeth by saying this, how can you treat a child this way? What if this were yours? Months from now, you're gonna regret this. Grace will be branded a communist as well. Grace will stand before a, a House Un-American Activities Committee in Memphis for this moment, for what she does. Grace's husband, was a professor at Philander Smith College and HBCU right here in Little Rock. Uh, Grace tried to take Elizabeth into a store, uh, a drugstore called Ponders. The family see them come and lock the doors. Grace will eventually get on a bus with Liz, and they, they ride off together. Liz will ride to her mother, who is a laundress at the time at the Arkansas School for the Blind and Deaf Negro. Uh, those schools had not been integrated by 1957 either. Meanwhile, the other students, here's one, Terrence Robert, have all kind of made their way to the rendezvous point, as told by Daisy Bates. Daisy is at home and hears on the radio these live reports about this unattended female student attempting to, to enter Central High School all alone. And that's when she remembers that in her haste, she hadn't gotten word to the Eckford family. And so she, she quickly dispatches her husband, LC, with a gun. LC will go and find Elizabeth in this crowd an attempt to try to take her back with him. She, she doesn't go with him. She's, she is just frozen in that moment. And uh, like we said, we'll leave after 35 minutes. Terrence Roberts and his other eight peers all meet there. They approach the crowd. They, I'm sorry, they approach the soldiers um, with that group of ministers. The ministers are pretty quickly stopped by 
not one of these men, but by the commanding officer of the Arkansas National Guard, a man named Marion Johnson, who lets them know pretty clearly, I am under orders from the governor of Arkansas not to let you in here, meaning those other nine students. They they go home. They quickly dispatch. Uh, and that's the first attempt at, at integration in Little Rock. There you see a photograph there. There's Marion Johnson. There's Carlotta Walls there to his immediate left. That dress actually is in the Smithsonian. Uh, to her left is Gloria Ray. To her left is Ernest Green. Behind Gloria Ray is uh, a young lady named Jane Hill. Jane Hill will, over the next several weeks before integration finally uh, happens, will withdraw. She is harassed. Her family is threatened um, with violence. And her father says, we're going to withdraw that transfer request and put you in horse man. So that's how we go from that 17 to 10 now to what will eventually be known by the, by the media um, as the Little Rock Nine. There you see Hazel, Sammy Dean, uh, and Burleson there to Hazel's right, giving an interview to Benjamin Fine. Hazel's name will pretty quickly be attached to that photograph. Hazel will, will leave Central High School as well. Uh, during the school year for fear uh, of, of retribution for her actions. Before we get to this moment on September 14th, let me sum up what all happens over the next roughly 10 days. The, the governor uh, says, I've brought these soldiers out to keep these students safe. He's afraid that his phones are being bugged by the FBI and that he's going to be extradited. So he, he conveys that to President Eisenhower, shown here in this photograph to his right, through his attorney general, through the, the U.S. attorney general, uh, Herbert Brownell, the president sends a telegram to the governor the next day saying, we have no evidence of this, and I will use everything in my, in my means to uphold the orders of the federal court. But nothing changes. The governor leaves those soldiers there. Over the next 10 days, there's, there is internal movement, but integration doesn't happen. Finally, Governor Faubus and Eisenhower sit down together. This photograph is in Newport, Rhode Island. Eisenhower is there at an Air Force base. The, the president sits down with the governor and they privately talk about this, uh, this kind of state federal standoff. We only know what happens really because of a diary entry from one of the president's secretaries. Governor Faubus is pretty quick to say to the, this former Supreme Commander of Allied Forces, look, I'm a veteran as well. Um, we've got this under control. Uh, this was done for the safety of those students. The president says, listen, you can leave those soldiers in place if you just make their orders to be that of protection. When they leave, after this photo is made, there's a joint press release that sounds like integration is going to proceed. The governor goes back to Little Rock, and when he's asked by some people in his uh, his his friends, I guess his cronies will say. Famously, he says in regards to that statement, just because I said it doesn't make it so. Six more days go by with, with no integration. And finally, that federal judge in Little Rock, Ronald Davies, holds a hearing to determine whether this injunction that's been applied for by, uh, by the governor is going to stand. The governor sends his attorneys. He doesn't even show up on his own. When the attorneys enter the room and the and the judge from the bench says, your injunction is denied. Those men turn around and leave. And Governor Faldus makes a statement that really makes him sound like he's the victim. As he's about to leave Arkansas and as he is removing the Arkansas National Guard from their positions at Central High School, he makes this statement. He says, now the crucifixion has begun. Over the weekend, with the governor in Georgia at a, at a Southern Governor's Conference, there is this movement from the mayor of Little Rock, Woodrow Mann, and the chief of police, and Daisy Bates, to get these students, now nine, into Central High School. The plan is made on Monday, September 21st, sorry, September 23rd, to bring these students into school. The students are brought by the police through a side entrance when the crowd figures out that they have been uh, duped. They pretty quickly respond in kind. There's four African-American journalists. This man's name here is Alex Wilson. You see in this photograph here, not only are men attacking him with their feet and a gentleman kicking him has a rock, a brick in his left hand, 
there are men standing in line to join in. Alex Wilson's a reporter uh, from Memphis, sent here to cover this moment. He never runs, never fights. But if you see live footage of this, you see th this brutal attack that he faced. He positioned to provide those nine students some cover to get into the school. This telegram then, you see the date and time, it's the next day, but before September 24th happens, on that Monday when the students enter the building, Woodrow Mann's son, who was his classmates and peers, pretty, pretty quick gathering of those nine students in the principal's office and the conversation from city hall at the high school few of these students and Woodrow man tells the, the the police chief get these students out of here I don't think governor Faubus is being uh, has been feeded like a king he has gone to a game on Saturday uh, at the University of Georgia and they stopped the game actually to honor this man. He is being revered for this stand he has made. And meanwhile, you could say he's he's fiddling while Rome is burning uh, back here in Little Rock. Woodrow Mann then sends these frantic telegrams. You can see who it's addressed to, President Eisenhower. And you can see the need for federal troops is urgent. He's begging for help. You see the words, I am pleading to you as president in the interest of humanity. He his request then leads to a couple things. On August 24th, uh, sorry, on September 24th, you see President Eisenhower go on television and speak to the nation. He's already signed two executive orders that essentially are a cease and desist to this crowd. When President Eisenhower goes on television on September 24th and talks to America, he talks about what's happening in Little Rock, but he's very careful. These are hand boots not to enforce integration, but to prevent opposition by violence to the orders of the court. He's very careful in his decision to send the 101st Airborne to Little Rock to make sure it's known that it's done for this purpose. It's not, again, not to enforce integration. Pretty quickly, 1,200 soldiers from the Arkansas National Guard, sorry, from the 101st Airborne arrive in Little Rock. You can see there a, a caravan of trucks crossing the Broadway Bridge here in Little Rock. There will eventually be a force of about 12,000 men because not only does the president send the 101st Airborne, he also federalizes the Arkansas National Guard. Here's Daisy Bates in front of her home with four of the Little Rock Nine, four of the young ladies, Elizabeth, Minnie, Jean, Melba, and Thelma. And their plans are to come to school then on Wednesday, September 25th, 1957. And so here's that scene again that was on the, the kind of the front panel of our program today. You see the 101st Airborne here with Jeeps, with guns in hand, with bayonets, helmets. Now you don't see little half tracks here in this photograph, but they are here and they've got this area cordoned off for this moment to happen. And while this photograph is not from that first day, this is pretty indicative of what's gonna happen. Um, with the 101st Airborne's uh, escort. You see the students getting out of a U.S. Army station wagon. They will be under 101st Airborne uh, protection until about Thanksgiving. But let's use that word protection very loosely. They are driven to school. They are driven from school. They are escorted into the building, usually in a diamond formation. They're escorted from uh, class to class. But there's this agreement from the principal of the high school and the commanding officer of this force, a guy named Edwin Walker, not to be too, um, uh, not to be in the way, not to impede other students' school year. So the Little Rock Nine will not be protected in the classroom, in the lunchroom, in the locker room, in the bathrooms, or in this massive auditorium uh, inside Central. Here you see students sitting by as these nine are escorted. You see. Uh, you see the resistance, right? You can see it in the form of that Confederate flag that uh, one student's holding. You see the student there kind of in the in the foreground uh, with the Johnny Reb hat on his head. 
these students, despite the fact, the Little Rock Nine, that they that they have this seeming protection, are going to be violently attacked every day of this school year. We know it because these two men here, Evan Walker there uh, at the left and William Coon there at the right uh, are the commanders, but also keep this record. It's called Operation Arkansas. And we know from that, we know troop movement, who is where, that there's soldiers there essentially 24 hours a day. They camp out at the campus. They're juggled to and fro from what's now Little Rock Air Force Base by helicopter. But we also know the incidents that happen because the press isn't allowed in the building. And so we know of the attacks that these nine students face because of the reports. Here you see soldiers at the main entrance, right, giving this seeming uh, invincible, uh, invincible line of defense, right, for the students, but we said it. Here's a classroom. There's Ernest Green, the lone senior. There's no soldiers in the classroom. So students put tacks on their chairs. They pull out seats. They don't share you know, resources with the students, books, any kind of equipment. You see the student there in the front row kind of at the at the teacher's right there laughing, right? Here's an escort to a, a, one of the vehicles. There's Mini Jean there uh, kind of facing off into the right. Again, seeming this invincible protection, but we know that Mini Jean in the end of the first semester uh, famously is attacked in the lunchroom. Some students try to knock her over with their chairs. This is December, right? This is months and months into this long process of being in school and, and not fighting back. Benny Jean has a tray with two bowls of chili. In, in her own words, she says um, that I accidentally, on purpose, dropped these bowls of chili on these students. When they take her, uh, when the students run out, a soldier comes in, takes Benny Jean to the principal, there's also this agreement with the principal and the soldiers that reports must be either given or corroborated by a soldier or else it doesn't happen. So Minnie Jean's story leads to her expulsion, uh, reduced to just a suspension for the remainder of the school year, so the end of semester one. Um, the students who were the protagonists here in this, in this fight are just told to go home, change their clothes, and come back to school. That's pretty consistent with with the treatment given to these students. Again, we said that they are pushed, kicked, spit on, thrown downstairs, um, attacked in the bathrooms, in the lunchrooms, in the locker room, right? Every place where there are no eyes on them is where they find attack. And there's no protection once they leave at the end of each school day. There's no protection for Daisy Bates as well. You see her home there with her front window taped. It'll eventually be covered with um, protective wrought iron because it's it's broken so much, uh, she does that just to, to keep um, some sort of protection on her home. Mini Jean, though, will face expulsion in February. She is attacked by a group of female students with a bag of combination locks. They wait for her. They kind of lie and wait and hit her in the face with, these, uh, with this purse. She picks it up and says, leave me alone, white trash, and is heard, overheard by a faculty member. Again, to corroborate that story, she's taken the principal, and the principal expels her pretty quickly after her expulsion. Someone from, we think, outside the building, possibly a parent, maybe an educator, we're not sure, has these cards produced that say one down, eight to go. And not only have they handed out to students dispersed inside Central High School, many of these students wear them like a, a badge of honor. The only senior we said is Ernest Green. So as we get closer to May, um, can't you imagine the pressure that, that dials up on him? And he is implored by other graduating, graduating students, other of the 602 students he'll graduate with, that one student says, I, I hope you'll be unselfish and use good judgment and not come to graduation because it's going to affect our graduation, right? Ernest, his books, his lockers ransacked in the hope that if he can't study for his exams, he can't pass, he won't graduate, right? And then we will have won. He graduates, he passes. He only is given four tickets, less than the other graduates, so he leaves one for family members. He saves one, though, for a gentleman who will come to Little Rock. Notice here he's walking alone. Notice behind Ernest, there's a member of the Little Rock Police Department. Ernest is joined that night by a young 
Martin Luther King Jr., who is here to speak. He gives Ernest a check uh, as a graduation gift. We talked to Ernest a few months ago and asked him about that, if he still had it, and he said he, that he wished he still did. But money to a graduate was you know, a check. He wanted to cash it. He didn't think about right, the long-term uh, the ramifications of keeping something like that. So here are those nine students and Daisy Bates, and around their necks, you see, is an award they received from the NAACP. It's the, the highest honor they can award. It's called the Spingarn Medal. Nine started, sorry, 10 started the school year. We, we were at nine when integration happens. We are at eight after many genes, expulsion, and then at seven after Ernest Green Gates. But then the governor gets back on the offensive after the soldiers leave. He makes this stand about, look at all the weapons we found in the school when we did this sweep. Now that the military's gone, military. So pretty quickly after passing four pieces of legislation through the Arkansas um, House and Senate, you then see a, a closure to the four high schools in Little Rock. But it's done after a vote. Listen to the choices on this, let's call it a referendum. If you vote yes to continue, to continue integration, that's fine. We will expand it to include every student in Little Rock. No more that Blossom plan of gradual integration. We're going to do it immediately. If you vote no, then we'll delay integration only where it's happened. Well, it's only happened in one place, right? Inside that building. If you read that sign, you can see the spin on this because when almost three fourths of Little Rock vote to delay integration, it's then presented to the public as that this school had been closed by order of the federal government. There's no, they left out the N in government there. Uh, but we call this the lost year. And with that propaganda also comes, you see this here from the White Citizens Council here in Arkansas. They really want to use the military's presence to try to re-drum up support for this massive resistance. There's the empty halls of Central High School during the lost year. There are no students in public high school in Little Rock for what will end up being one calendar year. Sorry, one school year. Uh, the seven of the Little Rock Nine left, five of those who would have been seniors find education elsewhere. They either leave Arkansas or they do correspondence work. Two of them will eventually receive degrees, diplomas from Central High School, uh, but the other three receive those from places in California or uh, Kansas City uh, as a result. 50% of the African American students, roughly 750 African American high school students that year, don't find education anywhere else. Private schools opened pretty quickly that year to accommodate white students. But this lost year is the part of the story that uh, never gets taught in schools. It's important to understand the repercussions of what President Eisenhower does. When schools reopen by court order after a case called Cooper v. Aaron, Jefferson Thomas and Carlotta are the two lone seniors. They're only joined by two other students of color in 1959. And the experience is very different. Instead of being attacked, harassed, punched, kicked, etc., they talk about just essentially being invisible. All nine of the students will eventually finish high school. Today, we're very lucky to have eight of them uh, still living. Two of them happen to live here in Little Rock. We saw one of them on Tuesday. Um, they are extraordinary people um, who have gone on to lead incredible lives. If they were here today on this call, on this presentation with us, um, they would be very encouraging about the continuation of this fight and the uh, uh, extending opportunity to more people. They each will say that this fight is not over, that we are six decades from it, but the work is not done. These, this photograph here is of statues that recognize them here uh, on the grounds of the state capitol in Little Rock. They are there, we get asked this a lot, why are they not at Central High School? Well, they are here because they actually face the office of where Governor Faubus would have sat when he attempted to deny or delay their opportunity. This is one of the last photographs of them together. Jefferson Thomas there at, at far left uh, passed away in October of 2010. Uh, but the story, again, like we said, this story continues on. It continues on in the lives that these nine individuals have lived and are still living. Uh, in the service that they have given. Um, 
we said they're extraordinary people, absolutely. They are extraordinarily ordinary people as well, in that if you ever get the chance to meet them, you will see that they, in addition to, to, to have done something so incredibly significant, are, are just like all of us. And that gives us hope, that gives us reason to encourage that anyone can do something like this. If you just have that motivation and the desire to do what is right. That is their story. Um, it's about quarter till, so I will happily, if there are any questions, Kate, be happy to answer them. Great, uh, thank you so much, Brian. Um, got a few questions coming in. Um, let's see. Uh, does the school today do anything to um, commemorate the Little Rock Nine, or do this, is there any student organization set up or anything? Yes, yeah, that's a great question. Yes, and and one of the reasons we can we have access to the school is an agreement with the school district. They want us in a non-COVID year. They want us to bring the public um, when we have public programming during school days into the school. The school is very supportive of what we do. There are organizations within the school and a litany of them. So probably too many for me to name that focus on Black Lives Matter. That focus on something. There's something called the Memory Project that wants to use stories like this and other stories, not just of a, a civil rights uh, origin, but stories from our past to help teach and affect our present and future. Um, absolutely, we're very lucky to have a great partnership with the Rock School District, with the superintendent, Mike Poor, with the principal, Nancy Russo, um, to allow us to give you that access and, and access to the students. And the students are taught this story the students come and see us. Every freshman will come and see us. Uh, and in many of those classes uh, during a normal school year, they're going to read a book. Um, it's essentially a diary from the year of integration by Melba Patilla Beals called uh, Warriors Don't Cry. Uh, yes. And it's great to work with these young people here at Central High School uh, and to, to see, you know, the next set of the Little Rock Nine, right? These next students who are involved in this movement and, and who are seeking um, opportunities uh, for themselves, but also for other people. Uh, what can a visitor uh, to Central High see today? Yeah, so that's a great question. So if you come visit um, the National Historic Site, the school is actually within the, the boundary. So you have the opportunity as a visitor to go walk on the grounds, walk by the reflecting pool. You saw those photographs of Little Rock Nine walking up the stairs. You can, you can do that as well. Um, it is still a functioning high school, so you can't enter the building uh, during school day. But you have that, um, let's call it front access, you know, seven days a week. Um, what we're doing now with programming because of COVID is taking people over there and doing everything but going into the school. So if you ever happen to come, use the NPS mobile app, which has a guided tour that you can use. And it will also have here soon an uploaded guided audio tour uh, done by the students at the high school, done by the Memory Project, that will navigate you through the story we just told you guys here on Facebook Live um, with audio and with a transcript. So it's, it is fully accessible. Oh, sounds great. Uh, let's see. Uh, are there any former white students who commented on their behavior from that era? Yes. Yeah, we've met some. We've met some of their um, children, grandchildren, etc. Uh, let me tell you this quick story. There was a group of mothers called the Mothers League of Central High who were just adamant in 1957 to use any kind of misinformation to create fear. Uh, they put ads in newspapers. They played upon the fear of having African-American students and white students together. Um, and several years ago, we had uh, a woman come in our building here at the visitor center. Very quiet, had people with her. And as she's leaving, I noticed she has tears rolling down her cheeks, which, which is not an uncommon reaction to a story that's so visceral and emotional. But I asked her if she needed anything, and she, she said, give me a piece of paper. I handed her a, a legal pad and she wrote in cursive very slowly with her hand shaking from her tears. Um, my mother was the head of the Mother's League of Central High. 
She couldn't even say it. I think she was so embarrassed of who her mother was and what she had been taught because this lady, Margaret Jackson, the daughter, was a student at Central High School as well, right? Many people like, like Margaret come back either wanting to make amends or hoping to find a way to apologize, to say I was wrong, maybe not for being violent, but I was wrong for being a silent witness. Honestly, Katie, that was the largest group of people in this story. They weren't the ones who did those horrible attacks. They were the ones who saw it and sat there and watched it and said, it's not my fight. I'm not going to get involved. Um, I've even had somebody tell me, uh, I was a student here in 1957. I never saw the military. I never saw the Rock Nine. I never saw a problem. Some people, I think, just chose to see what they wanted to see, which is not an uncommon response when you don't want to get involved. Um, let's see. Uh, how old were the Little Rock Nine? Yeah. So they were 14, 15, and 16 years old, right? Pretty, I mean, that's, that's incredible to comprehend, right? Uh, you know, they couldn't even legally vote, right? And yet they did this, right? Um, so at an age when, you know, I'm, I'm watch, right now watching kids leave the school who are, who are that exa exact same age. And so we, we tell young people sometimes, um, if you're 14, 15, or 16, we have, there goes your excuse, right? Why you can't do something great because that's the age of these these nine young people. So, um, so it seems like there were some clear inequalities in the schools. You mentioned the the cost to build the different ones. Uh, if separate but equal were a thing, how were they able to justify that if it was clearly unequal? Sure. Well, you have to think about when you know. When laws are made, who are the uh, executors of those laws, right? Who determines what really is separate but equal? And in this case, Central is built with all this money set aside by the Little Rock School Board, and Dunbar is kicked, you know, not even $200,000 of state funding. A lot of that money had to be raised by either the community or it was given by Julius Rosenwald, right? Famously, the Rosenwald Project were, were these schools you would see in really rural, remote areas of, of the South, especially. Um, so the separate but equal in this case, it's determined by the Little Rock School Board. It's determined by allocation of state funding. It's pretty easy to keep somebody um, uh, in, in deference when you don't extend those resources equally. It's pretty easy to have inequality when you do something like that. Right, no, no great example than, than those two schools, the size, the equipment. At Central, you know, every kid in, in you know, 1927 or 1954, every kid would have new books or new equipment. They would, you know, ha have everything the finest it could be, where Dunbar or Horseman would rely on used, donated, broken, damaged items from Central High School, right? So I mean, even the allocation of those resources, it's completely unequal. How have your education programs changed in the last year following the killing of George Floyd? I think maybe the, I don't know that we have changed what we talk about um, or the, the depth of this story, but I think our audience has, has expanded and we've had some pretty frank conversations um, about the Black Lives Matter movement. We've talked with, with young people who maybe have felt frustrated for a long time that their voice isn't being heard. There's a project we're working on now to do that very thing, to let young people essentially have a place uh, to protest, right, to vent, um, whether it be through written word, spoken word, just some way to let this last year and the events, the murder of George Floyd, um, the, the, the rising of Black Lives Matter, the pandemic, all the different things that have happened. Uh, even though young people are so very resilient, this has been a year and a half you know, like none other. I think this conversation has inspired, we, we've seen it, a lot more stewardship, a lot more service, and, and quite frankly, a lot more um, young people willing to stand up and kind of take that mantle from nine students who they've who they've heard about 
and and be leaders and be voices and advocates for change. Um, let's see. Uh, were any students from Little Rock sent to Dunbar to integrate or did it only ever go the one way? That's a great question, yeah. No, no students tried to, to integrate from Central High School to Dunbar uh, or to Horace Mann, right? Uh, and students who went to Central were given um, priority, I guess we'll call, to go to, to Hall High School that year. So Hall High School, the year that Central integrates, remains an all-white facility. Horace Mann remains an African-American-only facility. And the integration is not reversed. And it's not here in Little Rock. You know, this Blossom Plan is supposed to take seven to 10 years. So 1963, 64, 65, somewhere in there. Should it have been fully implemented? It's not fully implemented until 1972, but then you see this rise of school choice. Um, and if you if you don't integrate at certain years, you have to wait several more years, right? So desegregation here leads, it leads to resegregation fairly quickly. Uh, we're running a bit short on time, so let's just take out one last question. Um, Brent, what do you hope people take away from Little Rock when they come and visit? I really hope people take away the emotions of this story and really try to put themselves in the shoes of these nine young people, these nine children, essentially, who did something just so selfless and in the face of something that, that every day tried to get them to quit um, and, and release that opportunity. If you look behind me at the school, there's four statues. One of those statues has the words opportunity underneath it. If you can only take one word from the story, I hope that's the word you take with you. And you understand that the opportunities that you have been extended today are the result of someone else's sacrifice. And in this case, of someone's blood, sweat, and tears. I hope this story finds more, like we said earlier, more people ready to be advocates and, and not adversaries and, and inspires people to take up initiative whether it be at the high school level, in college, no matter where you live, no matter at what age you are. This is not a Southern story only. It's not a civil rights story only. This is a story of all of us. And it's going to take all of us to really implement and carry on significant change. Uh, this story is not over. And I hope you find this to be a place of, of inspiration and of action. And we will do everything we can when you come uh, to help you find those things through your experience with us. Brian, thank you so much. This was such a wonderful presentation. Thank you for being with us here today. You're welcome. Thank you for having us. Uh, and everyone, thank you for joining. And uh, if you want to join us back here again next week, uh, Wednesday at 4 p.m., we will be having a tour of Foxfire. Thank you, everyone.